Ah! Greetings, and welcome to Public Domain Classics here on McMinnville Community Media. I'm Walt Height, uh, and as you can plainly see, I'm wearing the costume of perhaps the most recognized literary character in history. I speak, of course, of Sherlock Holmes. Now, over the past century, dozens of actors have portrayed this iconic detective in movies, television, and on the stage. But for me, there is only one actor who will always be the definitive Sherlock Holmes, and that actor is Basil Rathbone. Now, Basil Rathbone was well known to moviegoers in the 1930s, often playing a, a suave villain or a sadistic headmaster, or in the case of Captain Blood, an arrogant pirate. But he was, he was the obvious choice to play the great detective by 20th Century Fox executives when they decided to make a film version of The Hound of the Baskervilles in 1939. The movie was a huge hit and prompted Fox to rush out a sequel the same year, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Well, sadly for us, those first two films are still protected by copyright. You know the rules. We can't show them to you here. But four of the remaining 12 movies in the series, all produced by Universal, were not renewed by that studio and are now in the public domain. And lucky for you, we're going to show you two of those four Sherlock Holmes adventures right now. In the first film, The Woman in Green, Holmes is pitted against well, none other than his most deadly adversary, Professor Moriarty, played deliciously here by Henry Daniel. From 1945, and featuring Nigel Bruce as Dr. Watson, here is Sherlock Holmes and the Woman in Green. I won't forget that morning, not if I live to be a hundred. I counted the men as they marched out of the yard. They'd hardly slept for weeks. We of the CID had slept even less, but the nightmare that kept us awake was all the same nightmare. That's why we weren't surprised when the commissioner asked us up to the conference room for a bit of a talk. He'd talked to us plenty, we knew that. It didn't help any to know what was ahead of us. Must we have that window open, Gregson? Oh, shut it if you want to. See if we'll be in enough of a temper without having a ruddy blast down the back of his neck. Gentlemen, the commissioner. Stuffy in here. Be seated, won't you? Gentlemen. If you wish to know what able men you are, read any of the works of popular fiction that glamorize your achievements, but don't, I beg of you, read the daily papers. They might give you an inferiority complex. I hate to mention it, but we are confronted with a series of the most atrocious murders since Jack the Ripper. And in the meantime, the CID might as well be playing at shove hate me for all the good we've accomplished. Now look, here, here, and here. Each of these red flags scattered through the city stands for a woman brutally murdered, a woman's terror, 
A woman's death agony. These are no ordinary crimes. These are the works of a fiend who kills first and mutilates afterwards. A ghoul who hacks off a part of his victim body and carries it away with him. A loathsome souvenir of his butchery. Three women murdered so far, and you haven't turned in one clue. You haven't given me one lead. Here you sit and wait for news of a fourth victim. With your arms folded. Well, we hadn't long to wait. It was down Lambeth Way where a young woman was hurrying home late last night. She saw something and stopped. It was a constable. He spoke to her and he walked along with her, just in case. He saw her go down the stairway to the basement lodging where she lived. We can only surmise what happened after that. pride in my pocket and went to see the man who had so often helped out Inspector Lestrade and myself in the past, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. If ever a man needed help, I did. This makes four, Inspector. Four defenseless women here in the heart of London. And everyone with the right forefinger hacked off. Not hacked, Inspector Gregson. Cleanly, expertly severed. The work of a skilled surgeon. That's her only clue. Much about the age of my sister's girl. Is there no way of stopping this, Mr. Holmes? Yes. There's a way, somehow. The fiend that did this. I promise. I promise. We have nothing to go on. That's the rotten part of it. We can't get far without knowing the motive. Or at least we know what the motives were not. It wasn't robbery, nor passion, thanks be, nor yet vengeance. Because they all came of totally unrelated families. Steady, Inspector, steady. I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. I don't turn a hair when it's a bloke that can look after himself. A little slip of a thing like that. Yes, it's horrible. Come on, let's get a drink. Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Vincent. Whiskey and soda, please, and a double for my friend here, Inspector Gregson. Thank you, sir. Thank you, mine Irish. Decent of you to give me a hand with this thing, Mr. Holmes. Always a pleasure to be of help to Scotland Yard, Inspector. A little out of my line, looking for a maniac who murders just for the fun of it. <laughs> or perhaps just to get a human finger. In all four cases, murderer risk capture by stopping to secure a finger. What for? Who knows? He's just a madman. Perhaps there's method in his madness. If we could just trace those missing fingers. If? If we could just train the English Channel, we might find a penny. Huh? Huh. Oh, thank you. You may keep those, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. Hmm. Sir George Fenwick, isn't it? Yes. That is daughter with him. Don't be so naive, Inspector. You know everyone, don't you, darling? Well, hardly. A week ago, I didn't know you. A week. How fast it's gone. I collect these things. How very quaint of you. Shall we go? Yes. What are you looking at, Mr. Holmes? Looking at a very handsome woman. Not to want the purple, but uh, giving an excellent imitation. Would you like to come to my flat for a nightcap? 
Lovely idea. Yes, isn't it? I wonder where she's taking Sir George Fenwick. Don't be so naive, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Mum. Hello, Grandon. Any messages? No, Mum. Thank you. Uh, drinks, Grandon. One of your nice surprises. Yes, Mum. I say, you don't mean that... Uh... Grandon's a marvel, aren't you, Grandon? Yes, Mum. You wouldn't believe the things she can do. Hmm. Ah, charming place. Delightful. Really? Do you think so? I'm so glad. Do sit down. Do you mind? Do I mind? What a question. I don't mind anything, really. Except not being with you. Now, you really don't want me to believe that, do you? Not too seriously. Good. We're both quite grown up, aren't we? Quite. You're a treasure, Crandon. And lower the lights a little as you leave. I prefer a more flattering light. <laughs> In any light you'd be... Would I? And don't you know it? <laughs> Perhaps I do. Oh, that priceless woman. You wouldn't believe it, but she's absurdly romantic. She loves dreamy music, and she thinks that we... But uh, we do, don't we? Do we? Well, it's rather soothing, restful. Yes. And we all need rest at times, like tired children who've played too long. You've played with wooden soldiers, I suppose. Hmm. Funny. Hadn't thought of that for years. Toy boats were my special joy. Anything I could set afloat anywhere. Like this. And this. Toy boats sailing into the Never Never Land. A land of beautiful dreams. Look. Look, odd, isn't it, how the light is reflected? Little specks of light that move and move like stars on a slowly moving stream. You know, Holmes, I'm very sensitive to atmosphere. No. Yes, I can tell by the feel of this room there's been a murder committed here. It may interest you to know, my dear fellow, it was the other side of that door at the foot of the stairs that the poor girl was murdered. If only I could find it. Find what? The one thing these unfortunate victims have in common that might give us a motive for these murders. There must be something. Another Jack the Ripper, if you ask me, a homicidal maniac. Oh, Watson, in the case of Jack the Ripper, there was one thing in common. His victims were all from one walk of life, living in the same section of the city. In this case, the murderer chooses his victims from all walks of life and from different sections of the city. No, my dear fellow, this is not the work of a homicidal maniac. It's something infinitely more sinister. You mean the creeps? What earth are you talking about? Watson, I'm convinced that these murders are only incidental to some larger and more diabolical scheme. That may be, but why the severed fingers? The answer to that question, my dear fellow, is our only hope of solving these mysteries. Dear sister, I am so happy. I had such a lovely holiday at Brighton with you and Alf. And I'm looking forward to being with you again. Poor little thing. Sort of raises a lump in your throat. 
I can picture her sitting here happily writing this letter. And I'm not bit realizing that she's shortly going to her death. Hello? Gregson. Oh, there you are, Mr. Holmes. I've been looking for you everywhere. What's happened? Murder in Edgeway Road, not half an hour ago. Woman? Yes. On the right forefinger, cut off clean. Fancy, ma'am. There's been another of those horrible murders. Dear, dear, how shocking. Yes, ma'am. I really don't feel quite safe here myself. Oh, dear. Why, Sir George? I must see Miss Marlowe at once. I, I don't know I, if she... I must see her. Where is she? Lydia. Why, Sir George, what is it? What happened? I don't know. You'll have to help me. You've got to help me. But I don't understand. Listen, I woke up a few minutes ago in a cheap boarding house off Edgware Road. I don't know how I came there. I don't know when. The last thing I remember is being here with you. Calm yourself, Sir George. When did I leave here? Well, it was about... Uh... It was 10.45, Mum, precisely. You seemed, uh, forgive me, just a little distressed. Detached, not interested. I thought I'd said something to offend you. I don't remember. I can't remember. Tell me, has this happened to you before? Before? Well, there is such a thing as amnesia, you know. If it was 10.45 when I left you, it was nine this morning when I woke. Over ten hours lost. Ten hours that I can't account for. And in my pocket when I woke, I found... Yeah, in my pocket. That, that, that isn't... Oh, it's not for you, of course. It can't be. Excuse me, Mum, but there's a man asking to see the gentleman. Send him away. Yes, Mum. No, 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 please. I'll see him. Well? Delightful room. Not much like the place you woke up in this morning. You followed me here? Yes. Are you uh, a detective? Oh, no. Quite the contrary. Don't be afraid, Sir George. You know my name? Oh, yes. A very old and highly honored name. And being the bearer of such a name, and also a very wealthy man, I thought 
You might care to possess yourself of this trifle. Rather than let it fall into the hands of the police. It is yours, if I'm not mistaken. The initials, GF. Where did you get this? It came out of your pocket. I saw it fall, but you never noticed. You were very busy bending over something with a knife. Then you put something in your pocket. Come along, Holmes, come along, come along. How many more times must I tell you? You're missing a treat. This is delicious. A little jam tarts to follow. Aren't you tempted? Mm. You and your flesh pots. They tell me that the fish is good for the brains. Brains haven't any. You realize that a day, a whole day, and a night have gone by since that bestial affair in Edgware Road? I'm as much in the dark as ever. Hello, here comes a client, unless I'm very much mistaken. Very attractive. Obviously, she left home under the stress of some very great emotion. How do you know that? She isn't wearing any gloves. A startling omission in a young lady of fashion. No, she didn't put her coat on. Open car, too. Furthermore, there's something in that bag she wants to show me. What makes you say that? The bag doesn't match her dress. Indicating it was picked for size rather than style to accommodate some bulky object. You amaze me, Holmes. I'll mention, my dear fellow. Well, that's interesting. What is? A cab, turning at the empty house. I wonder why he followed her here. Oh, wouldn't you? Bye, <laughs> Parson, we knew that is. No. Yes, Mrs. Hudson? It's a young lady, sir. Most urgent. Ask her to come in. Uh, go right in, miss. Mr. Holmes? Yes, this is my friend, Dr. Watson. How do you do? How do you do? Mr. Holmes, I... You must excuse me, please, I... Yes, well, won't you sit down? Uh, come along. May I? It's quite all right. Try to control yourself, Miss Fennick. You're with friends. You know my name? No magic, I assure you. I've often seen your picture. You're the daughter of Sir George Fennick, aren't you? Yes. It's about my father that I... What about your father, Miss Fennick? Oh, I don't know what to do. He's always been the nicest, dearest person. Only since Mother died. Yes, yes, but uh, we, we know. So I didn't think anything of it when he was away all night before last. But he didn't come home until yesterday at tea time. He didn't come in for dinner at all. Just paced up and down in the library hour after hour. I begged him to let me in, but he wouldn't. Steady, steady. Now take your time. I couldn't sleep a wink last night. Then I started hearing things. Hearing things? What sort of things? I heard someone in the garden underneath my window. Then I saw a figure moving down the garden path. And I recognized my father. Stealing through his own garden, like a thief. He had a spade in his hand. And he stopped by the greenhouse where he started to dig. This morning, at daybreak, I, I stole out into the garden and... I found this.
finger. A human finger. Bring up Scotland Yard, Willie Watson. Ask them to get hold of Inspector Gregson and tell him to meet us at once at George Finnick's house, Kingston. Operator, get me Scotland Yard quick. Where's my father, Norris? He's still in the library, miss. Thank you. We'll see him right away. Will you come with me, please? Thank you. I got your message, Mr. Holmes. Yes, indeed. Dad, may I come in? Dad. That's funny. He doesn't answer. You mind? Please do. Thank you. Watson, quick. Oh. Come along, no, my dear. No, no, no. Take charge, Miss Fenwick, please. Please, sir. Now, please, please. Uh, please, come along with me. Dead? Yes. What do you make of it, Doctor? Shot in the back, between the second and third ribs. The bullet undoubtedly penetrated the heart. Look at the powder marks on his coat. I'm a afraid of this. What do you mean? Don't you remember the man in the cab who followed Miss Fenwick to Baker Street? Well, you don't think he had anything to do with it, do you? I think it's reasonable to assume that he tipped off someone that I'd been sent for. Sir George has obviously been murdered to keep him from telling me what he knew. What was the weapon used? Small caliber revolver, point blank range by the look of the wound. <laughs> the murderer came in through those French windows. The mud from the garden he brought in on his boots. Sir George must have surprised the intruder. Passed the room to him here. Hmm. What follows, we can't tell. But from the location of the wound, I'd say that he turned his back for a moment, and as he turned, the muzzle of the revolver was placed between his ribs and one muffled shot fired. And you mean to say he kept on going, even after he was shot? There's no doubt about it. Look there. The trail of blood leads us back to the desk. There's something Sir George was after. Something. I know. He was trying to summon help, Poacher. I don't think so, Watson. There's the bell pull by the fireplace. No, you'll notice from the trail of blood that Sir George made straight for this desk here. I wonder. Or something he was desperately anxious to get. Hello. His right hand's clenched. That's perfectly natural. Death agony. But the left hand lies open. Why only one hand clenched in the death agony? The, the right hand, the hand nearest the desk. Please note that. If Sir George took something off this desk, something so important that he spilled his last drop of blood to get it, I want to know what it is. Nothing but an ordinary match folder. Where does that lead us? I imagine to something very important, Gregson. This match folder's from Pembroke House. Why shouldn't it be? He was there, you know. We saw him yesterday. Yes, but the effort he made after he was shot to get hold of this match folder. It's just possible he wanted someone to remember Pembroke House. He may have wished to recall it to someone who saw him there, someone who like ourselves, saw him with a woman. Nigel Bruce played Dr. Watson in all 14 films, then went on to play him on the radio for two years, but with the new actor Tom Conway in the role of Sherlock Holmes. His interpretation of Watson as a, a fussy and slightly bungling character bore no similarity to the character created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes' author. A truer depiction of Watson will be found in, well, just about every other movie or television series where he is intellectually on fairly level ground with the detective. Uh, but audiences loved Nigel Bruce. He was the perfect ally with an almost childlike naivete that sometimes even bordered on buffoonery. His errant guesses would always be kindly dismissed by Holmes, who would then go on to explain what was taking place or why some crime had been committed. For 1940s audiences, oh, it was a match made in heaven, and the success of the series helped keep Universal Studios in business. Now, Nigel Bruce made a handful of films after the Sherlock Holmes series ended, most notably Limelight with Charlie Chaplin in 1952. In 1954, still only 58 years old, he died of a heart attack in Santa Monica, California. Okay, back to the woman in green.
Come in. Oh, Dr. Watson, this came by hand for Mr. Holmes not ten minutes ago. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. That would be the report from Mr. George's bank. Report from Mr. George? Oh, really? Don't you remember his daughter told us that he just closed his account? Had it looked into it once. Hmm. He drew out his entire balance in cash, nearly 10,000 pounds, yesterday, just after that young woman was murdered. What does that suggest to you, Watson? That he paid it out to someone. Precisely. I smell the faint, sweet odor of blackmail. You don't think he paid it out to someone who saw him murder the McLean woman? Sir George never murdered anyone. But he did have that woman's finger, and he evidently did have a lot of, and pay out a lot of cash. That's the terrifying part about blackmail, Watson. The victim is afraid to fight the accusation, no matter how false. Once the accusation is made, the name is smeared, and sometimes his life is ruined. Well, Sir George didn't commit these murders. What fiend did? I rather think they're not the work of any one man. Oh, come, Holmes. You don't expect me to believe there's a whole organization going about killing people and, and chopping off their fingers. That's no, possible, quite possible. Well, wh whoever's behind all this thing must be out of his mind. On the contrary, my dear fellow. If my assumptions are correct, this little scheme has behind it the most brilliant and ruthless intellect the world has ever known. You don't mean Professor Moriarty? I do. Oh, steady, Holmes. You've got him on the brain. This is the third time in as many months you've suspected him of unsolved crimes. He's dead, you know. Is he? Is he? You know he is. He was hanged in Montevideo well, over a year ago. I know that someone was hanged in Montevideo under that name. But I'll stake my reputation that Moriarty is alive and here, now in London. Hello? Yes, but Dr. Watson, wait a minute. You me? Hello, oh, yes. This is Dr. Watson speaking. No, no, I'm afraid I've retired. I don't practice anymore. What? Oh, that's a, that's a different thing. An emergency case. Well, just a minute. Yes? Yes, well, see, she's not moved. Remember that? Don't touch it till I get there. Fractured case in, in McCardle's Mews. Heavy woman. Fourteen stone. Oh, look at him. <coughs> Fourteen stone. Oh, just the sort of person who would hoist herself up on a stool to feed the canary. There ought to be a law against fat people keeping little dicky birds. Well, so long, old man. I shan't be very long. I haven't used that bag since I brought little Amelia. What's her name in the world? She grew up to be a very unattractive child. Oh, who wouldn't with a name like Amelia? What oh, Amelia? Oh, Amelia. Professor Moriarty. Not that I wish to appear inquisitive, but to what am I indebted for the pleasure of this visit? Scotland Yard will be interested. It's very convenient for me to have Scotland Yard think that I'm still dead in Montevideo. I never dreamed of fooling you. Thank you. The thought occurs to me, Mr. Holmes, that there are some advantages in living within the law. They are very comfortably fixed here, aren't you? As I get on in life, the little comforts appeal to me more and more. Oh, I beg your pardon. Won't you sit down? 
Thank you. And now, Professor Moriarty, what can I do for you? Everything that I have to say to you has already crossed your mind. And my answer has no doubt crossed yours. That's final. What do you think? I shall not rest until you are hanged for the finger murders. You've no proof, you know. No, not a shred. But I have you. I could turn you over to the police here and now. You could. But if you did, you'd never see Dr. Watson again. Oh, the telephone call. Quite. I rather assumed you had taken some such precaution. Or I should have snatched up a revolver and indulged in a fit of heroics when you came in. Very smart, aren't you? Not smart enough. Or I should have anticipated you. But if any harm comes to Dr. Watson, I shall seek you out. I shall not rest until I find you, and when I do... No harm will come to Dr. Watson this time. But I can't answer for the future. Mr. Holmes, I should strongly advise you to drop this case. Don't be silly. Think it over. We've had many encounters in the past. You hope to place me on the gallows. I tell you, I shall never stand up on the gallows. But if you are instrumental in any way in bringing about my destruction, you will not be alive to enjoy your satisfaction. And we shall walk together through the gates of eternity, hand in hand. What a charming picture that would make. Yes, wouldn't it? You know, I really think it might be worth it. Shoelaces, Governor? Tons of pair. And strong enough to hang yourself. How many more times since I tell you I don't want your filthy shoelaces or your company? Shoelaces, Governor? Nasty impertinence. Run along, my good man, or I'll give you in charge. Shoelaces, Governor? Shoelaces, Governor? You're a poor bloke. <laughs> What's only got one arm? Any luck with Mr. Holmes? You can read his obituary in tomorrow's papers. Come in. I was, um, just going out to look for you. Look for me? What for? I suppose you don't think I know my way about. Well, you're right, I don't. Blast all practical jokers, anyhow. Know where I've been? On a wild goose chase. Exactly. There's no such number in McArdle's muse. Some fool's idea of a joke. Did you, uh, did you see anyone? No, nobody especially. Only a whining old idiot selling bootlaces. Persistent beggar, wasn't he? Stuck you like grim death. Oh, how do you know? And finally I left you for someone who looked like Philip Pickings. Someone, my dear Watson, was Professor Moriarty himself. What? He's just called on me. Moriarty here and you let him go? But you must be out of your mind. Why? Well, he bluffed me into believing that he was holding a friend of mine as hostage. Friend of yours who? Oh, nobody very important, just a fat, lazy fellow. Medical man, I believe. Medical man? Do I know him? Uh, yes, I think you do. Uh, fellow by the name of Watson. Watson, Watson, never heard. Oh, me? I'm afraid so, old fellow. Your street hawker's job was to do away with you in a certain contingency. And you let Moriarty go because of me? I had no choice. I can't afford to lose you, old fellow. Well, it's a very decent of the old chap, I must say, but uh, well, uh, I wish you'd nabbed him. We shall, never fear. I know the motive for the finger murders. All I have to find out now is the method used with the blackmail victims. Method? Yes. How does Moriarty get them to the scene of the crime? How does he plant those severed fingers on them? And how does he scare them into believing that uh, they may have committed those atrocious murders themselves? Curious. Very curious. Huh? Curious? What's curious? That window in the empty house across the street. First floor front. Oh? What's wrong with it? It's open. <laughs> Why shouldn't it be open? Well, it wasn't open half an hour ago. I'll stake my life on that. Oh, that's not our business. 
Let it stay open. <laughs> I, uh, wonder if you'd go over, old fellow, and see what's the matter. Oh, trespassing. It's against the law. Hmm? Well, well, I'll go myself. Oh, well, if you're going to put it like that, ridiculous waste of time. Going about shutting windows at this hour of the night. Yeah, you better take this torch. Well, take what? <laughs> Dignified job for a doctor. Dr. Watson, the torchbearer. And what do you propose to do? Sit in a comfortable chair, I suppose, and read a good book. That's a very good idea. Yeah, it's a very good idea. While I play night watchman, you have a nice read. Mm -hmm. Good night, have a good time. Have a good time, what do you mean, have a good time? Thing to keep about the house. <laughs> Must have been a pet. <laughs> <laughs> It's comfortable reading a book. shoot you a second ago. Not me, my dear fellow. Merely the bust of Julius Caesar. Incidentally, you may have noticed that uh, all through the ages, prominent men have prominent noses. Shh. Oh, I'm afraid we're in for terrible trouble again with Mrs. Hudson. Window smashed, plaster all over the floor. Get up, you. Corporal Williams, Middlesex Regiment. Discharged from the army as physically unfit. Huh. Papers seem in order. Now, Corporal Williams, you've seen service in the Far East, haven't you? The East? I thought so. Look at his complexion, Watson. Yellow as saffron. He's been taking atabrine. Cure for malaria. Sniper, aren't you? Sniper? Hmm. Why did you try to kill me? I had to kill him. I had to. Oh, snap out of it. Stop it, Watson. He's shamming. No, he isn't. Who told you to kill me? She told me. She told you? She told me I couldn't miss. Well, luckily you did miss, you murderer. He isn't a murderer, Watson. Listen, Corporal Williams. She told you you had to do it, didn't she? I had to do it. I've got it, Watson. I've got it. Got what? The method used in the finger murders. Well, what is it? Hypnotism, my dear fellow. Hypnotism. And it wasn't against his nature. That's the devilish part of it. They picked a man for their purpose whose job was sniping. Who are they? Professor Moriarty and his finger murderers. William spoke of a woman. I think you'll find that she asked him home tonight for a drink. Nice quiet rooms, soft lights, music. You've got it all pat, Mr. Holmes. What's the lady look like? Oh, uh, up 30, 
Nice figure, blonde, lustrous eyes. Oh, really? Got a phone number? Oh, so? Williams will give us her address. Look after him, Gregson. Don't let anyone come near him. He's our key witness in the finger murders. Well, I hope you're guessing right, Mr. Holmes. Get up, Williams. Now, go with Inspector Gregson anywhere he tells you. Come on. Yeah. Ring me as soon as he comes to himself, will you? I will. Good night, gentlemen. Good night. Well, if you believe that fellow Williams was hypnotized, I suppose you think Sir George Fenwick was hypnotized too. Yes, I'm quite sure of it. Have a cup of tea? Thanks, old boy. Nothing to eat. But why didn't these people make Sir George do the murder himself? Because they didn't want to get him hanged. They, uh... They wanted to blackmail him. Well, who do you think the actual murderer is? One of Moriarty's gang. A diabolically simple technique. Kill a woman. Yes, yes, yes. But, but why cut off the fingers? My dear fellow, don't you understand? The severed finger is what links the blackmail victim to the murder. He wakes, finds the grisly thing in his pocket. He doesn't know how he got there. He's no idea that he's been hypnotized. For all he knows, he may have committed the atrocious crime during some dreadful lapse of sanity. In that state, when he's utterly demoralized, the blackmailers take over, is that it? Undoubtedly. You see, they swear that they saw him commit the murder. And being human, the victim will pay anything rather than stand trial on a charge that will make his very name loathsome. Oh, it all fits in if you believe in hypnotism. The only possible explanation. You think the hypnotist is that uh, woman with the blonde hair and the lustrous eyes, the, <laughs> the woman you invented? I didn't invent her. I saw her. What on earth are you talking about? That woman, my dear Watson, was with Sir George when he left Pembroke House. I saw her there. I shall see her again, and Williams will lead me to her. That's why it's so important to keep him safe. He will identify her. Hello? Yes? Inspector Gregson? What? Well, get every constable in the district. Yes, I'll be over at once. What's happened, Holmes? Williams is missing. Great Scott! Come on. Lorry crashed into Gregson's car. During the confusion, Williams disappeared. Escaped, eh? No, kidnapped. To keep him from talking when he came to. You don't think that Moriarty... Oh, Moriarty? Anything is possible. Williams! Dead. You see? Anything is possible. Good morning, Professor Moriarty. You startled me. I'm dressing another dolly, a dear little nurse. Is there anything wrong with your finger? Just a splinter. Nasty thing, splinters. Most trying. One can't be too careful. But I'll get it out for you. I have the very instrument to help. Sharp enough to split a hair. Put those tools away until they're needed. But they're not tools, sir. They're instruments. Put them away. Is Lydia in? Yes. But really, you should let me... Get dressed. Holmes and Watson just left Baker Street for the Mesmer Club. Mesmer Club? The meeting place of all the top hypnotists in London. Do you suppose that Mr. Holmes is on to our method? If he suspects... It's merely a suspicion. It's our business to see that it ends there. I hope you're right. William has passed away before he could talk, remember? What do you want me to do? Go to the Mesmer Club, meet Holmes, and induce him to come back here. Isn't that a bit dangerous? Every meeting with Sherlock Holmes is potentially dangerous. However, you say he didn't see your face at Pembroke House. And... 
How would you suggest I get Mr. Holmes to accompany me here? Kidnap him? Oh, no. Holmes has one weakness, his insatiable curiosity. If you can arouse that, you can lead him anywhere. It's up to you to take advantage of any opportunity that may arise. Yeah. This way, please, gentlemen. I'll tell Dr. Onslow that you're here. Thank you. And this is the Mesmer Club. If you ask me, hypnotism is a lot of mumbo-jumbo. Oh, come now, Watson. As a medical man, you must admit that hypnotism has its place in modern science. That may be, but 90% of hypnotists are crooks of the worst kind. Nothing more than a lot of charlatans exploiting weak-willed morons. Ah, Dr. Onslow, I believe. Uh, happy to meet you, Mr. Holmes. Uh, your brother Mycroft suggested I might be of help to you. Uh, he's a valued member of our little group of uh, charlatans and crooks. Oh, I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't know you were listening. Oh. Behind the curtain. My mm -hmm. friend, Dr. Watson. Ah, oh, delighted. Oh, do you know? I wonder now. You see, we're in the midst of a little experimental session at this very moment, if you'd uh, care to join us. Oh, certainly, certainly. I'd be very instructive. Oh, well, will you follow me? Yeah. Thank you. Why should I know that we're behind the blast of clinical? In treating his patients. But today, the therapeutic value of hypnotism, as we now call it, is conceded by innumerable physicians. Especially is it of value in surgical cases where the administration of local or of general anesthetic is inadvisable. Inadvisable poppycock. <laughs> oh, sorry. For the sake of latecomers, I may say that I have placed this subject under profound hypnosis. In this condition, he can feel no pain, even under applications which normally would be excruciating. Excruciating? <laughs> you excuse me, please. Carter? You are having a peaceful sleep. You feel nothing. Your arms and your hands are without sensation. Mowbray, the long needle. Carter, give me your right hand. As you observe, the needle has been thrust completely through the subject's hand. No feeling, no pain. This lack of feeling is the one infallible test of profound hypnosis. Nonsense. Fellow's full of drugs. Oh, isn't he? Definitely not, Doctor. <laughs> wake up, Carter, wake up. You feel well and rested, remember? No pain anywhere. Wake up, wake up. I say, when are you going to begin? All through, Carter. Stand up. This way, sir. And uh, are these all the people that come here? Oh, no, no, no. Others keep dropping in all the time. I suppose it's all right for those who believe in it, but of course, I'm a professional man myself. Then you don't believe in hypnotism, Dr. Watson? Oh, I don't deny that there are certain types of hysterical, feeble-minded people who go under if you point your finger at them. But anyone with a with an ounce of character. <laughs> <laughs> How right you are. You see right through our little artifices, don't you, Doctor? Right through, my dear sir. Right through. Right so. But with the feeble-minded, as you say. Uh, excuse us, Mr. Oh, Holmes. Certainly. Uh, step over here, won't you? Certainly, sir. Anything to oblige. <laughs> Let me show you how easily we charlatans uh, take advantage of them. Now, sit down, Doctor. <laughs> now, we set a thing like this in motion. It's wonderful, the attraction on the feeble-minded, of course. The continuous motion, if they just let themselves follow it. Of course, you could stare at it till doomsday, Dr. Watson, with no effect at all. Still, it might make you a little drowsy, like the white ribbon of road at night when you're driving. The rhythm is smooth, unbroken, and the road goes on and on round and round, always the same, winding and winding. And you're drowsy, you're tired. Let the road come into you, as it were. The long road, the smooth road, 
the road to sleep. Sleep. Open your eyes. Stand up. Turn around. And now, Dr. Watson, you're on a holiday in Scotland. The country is amazingly beautiful. We're coming to a stream. It isn't deep. Better take your shoes and socks off. Roll up your trouser. Uh, that will do. The other leg is waterproof. Turn around. Mind the pebbles. Sit down. Wake up now. Yeah, I see. What did I tell you? It didn't work with me. Why, nobody with an ounce of carry. Hmm? Hmm? Yes, I think you'll need these. <laughs> Shall I go last night? Watson, she's here. Oh, the woman you're looking for? Yes, I'm going to meet her. Perhaps I can induce her to take me to Moriarty. Do you think it's wise, Holmes? It may not be wise, but it's essential. After all, I've held me on with Moriarty in the past. But isn't it dangerous? She might be a hypnotist. If my will isn't stronger than hers, I deserve to be hypnotized. Shh. I feel I must protest, Dr. Onslow. I was told this was a gathering of serious students of a great science. And I find myself in a company of buffoons. Oh, my dear man. Elliot's and Esde are brave. Were those men martyrs for the truth? That you may laugh over your childish, cruel tricks? I must say I'm in complete agreement with you, madam. This was most unnecessary performance, Dr. Onslow. Beg your pardon, sir. My name is Holmes, Sherlock Holmes. At your service, madam. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid I've created a rather embarrassing situation. But you see, I'm interested in the serious study of hypnotism. So am I, too. Perhaps we have something in common, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps we have. Do you join me for a cocktail at Pembroke House? I should be delighted. Good. Thank you. I didn't know there was such a pleasant place in London. It was so nice of you to suggest our coming here. I thought a little picking up would do us good. You mean you thought I looked... Uh... I like the way you look. Thank you. I suppose I did lose my head a little at the Mesmer Club. But you see, hypnotism is almost a religion with me. I know so well what it can do to help and heal. And I can't bear to see it used for trivial purposes. I know very little about it. That's why I went to the Mesmer Club. You see, I'm rather puzzled just now with the case that I'm working on. How fascinating. Tell me about it. It's the murder of Sir George Fenwick. Fenwick? Who is he? Quite a well-known figure. Odd now I come to think of it. The last time I saw Sir George was here at Pembroke House. Strange. Yes, isn't it? He was sitting... Um, I believe he was sitting at this very table. Cigarette? Thanks. Do go on. There was a charming lady with him. He was, uh... He was lighting a cigarette. Charming. Did you see her face? No worse luck. Merely her back. How unenterprising of you. Yes, wasn't it? Afraid I'm getting a little older. I shouldn't say so. That's nice of you. Still, the first time in my life I've got hold of a case that's beyond me. I'm actually losing sleep over it. You know, Mr. Holmes, I believe I could help you. Really? I should be very grateful. You're amused. Oh, merely skeptical. How would you go about it? I've used hypnotism more than once in healing. Not for profit. I'm not a professional. But I do think I could help you. If you care to... I can't think of a pleasanter experience.
lights, music, is that all there is to it? You must relax, Mr. Holmes. I'm afraid you're a rather difficult subject. So I thought perhaps a little help. Materia Medica might be advisable. Drugs? No, I'd rather not, if you don't mind. As a matter of fact, I'd rather not myself. But shrink not he practiced in Munich, you know. Believed it the best means for difficult subjects. Do you mind? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't approve of sedatives. Just as you wish. We don't have to go on with this at all, you know. Wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. All right. I'll take a chance. It's really quite harmless. What is it? Cannabis japonica, an oriental soporific. You need water. Thank you. Now sit down, Mr. Holmes. You feel yourself growing drowsy. Don't fight it. Give in to it. Because you do want to sleep, you know. Just fix your eyes on this one white flower floating on the water. Empty your mind of every other thought. Follow the motion of the water. So smooth. Not a ripple. Waters of forgetfulness. Steady. Deep. Strong. Strange, isn't it? How the light is reflected. Little specks of light that move and move. It's restful here. Peaceful. It's friendly. And you're very close to finding what you're looking for. You'll find them soon now. The guilty ones. When you're rested. Gentle waters closing over you. Steady. Deep. Draw, drawing you down, down, down. Here he is, Professor Moriarty. Stand up, Mr. Holmes. Open your eyes. Face this way. Are you satisfied? We are dealing with a clever man. He may be shamming. There's just one infallible test for profound hypnosis. You ready, Dr. Simnel?
That will do, Doctor. He couldn't fake insensibility to the knife. I congratulate you, Lydia. Turn round, Mr. Holmes. Now walk to the desk. Sit down. Take that pen and write what I tell you to write. I have at last found a case which I cannot solve. I have outlived my usefulness. Therefore, I have decided to end my life. Sign your name. Now blot it. Fold it up. Put it in your pocket. Comes to Sherlock Holmes. Go out onto the terrace. But it won't look like suicide, sir. I'm sorry, but Mr. Holmes' injuries must all be self-inflicted. Let's walk a little, Mr. Holmes. It's so pleasant here in the garden. Just step up here onto the terrace. It's a nice, broad terrace. Now turn to the left and walk slowly to the end of the terrace. Don't stop. You must walk to the end, you know. end leads to an open doorway. You can pass through it in perfect safety. In the room beyond the doorway, you'll find what you've been looking for. Must you drag this on? This is the moment I've been anticipating for a long time, my dear. Go on, Mr. Holmes. Through the open doorway, you will find the man responsible for the finger murders and the death of Sir George Fenwick. Professor Moriarty. Holmes! Stand still! What a beautiful view, Watson. I'm quite enjoying it. No, you're not. You're hypnotized. You're under a spell. Stand still. Don't move. Steady, Holmes. Steady, does it? Stand perfectly still where you are. Nonsense, Watson. Uh, you, you don't know what you're doing. Of course I know what I'm doing. You mean you're not hypnotized? Certainly not. Then get off the wall, you idiot. Oh, oh, look out! Hold! Oh, oh. Dear fellow. What were you doing out there? Holding the fort until you arrived? What kept you? Well, I ran into a spot of trouble on my way to Scotland Yard. I was arrested for exceeding the speed limit. Your luck seems to hold, Mr. Holmes. Well, I'd hardly call it luck, Professor. You see, I substituted a drug of my own for the one that this dear lady pressed on me. You are clever, aren't you? A drug that, um, although it leaves the subject conscious, renders him quite insensitive to pain. That accounted for my lack of reaction to Dr. Simnel's knife. Well, Gregson, quite an impressive haul. Even Inspector Lestrade himself couldn't have done any better. Thanks, Mr. Holmes. Take him away. All right, put her in the van. I was right, Mr. Holmes. You are a difficult subject. Thank you. And now, Professor, our score is settled. Au revoir until I see you on the gallows. The rope has not been made that'll go around my neck. Come on. Take care of things, Mr. Holmes. Thank you, Inspector. Come on. An evil man, Holmes, but what a horrible death. Better than he deserved. What are you thinking of? I'm thinking of all the women who can come and go in safety in the streets of London tonight. The stars keep watch in their heavens. And in our own little way, we too, old friend, are privileged to watch over our city.
So the evil Professor Moriarty plunges to his death from a building ledge, or at least that's what we're led to believe. In two previous movies, Moriarty supposedly died, and each time it was the result of a long fall. Now what's with all this falling to his death stuff over and over again? <laughs> My theory is that it was a deliberate decision by the studios. In literature now, both Holmes and Moriarty meet their demise by falling from a ledge near a waterfall in Switzerland. I'm referring to the story, The Final Problem, written in 1893 and intended to be the last appearance of the great detective. Arthur Conan Doyle wanted to move on to other projects. He felt that the Holmes stories were an impediment to his growth as an author. Eventually, of course, he brought the detective back to life. But it's my belief that both Fox and Universal paid homage to the final problem by disposing Moriarty in basically the same way each time. And you, you just saw the ending of The Woman in Green. It was from a ledge. Well, let's move on. The second film in our Sherlock Holmes double feature is Terror by Night. Next to last in the series, it features the return of one of Holmes' favorite foils, Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. Always one step behind Sherlock Holmes, Lestrade appeared in five of the Universal productions and was played by Dennis Hoey, a British actor who moved to America in 1931. From 1946, here is Sherlock Holmes and the Terror by Night. Rhodesia is one of the most famous of the Earth's treasures. First touched by the fingers of the humble Kaffir, it would have been better had it never been found. For all those who possessed it came to sudden and violent death. Our story opens in London within the sound of Bow Bells. In the shadow of Tower Bridge is the carpenter's shop of Mock and Son, coffin makers. A beautiful job, if I may say so. You'll be sure to have it at the undertaker's in time. Of course. The Scotch Express leaves Euston Station at 7.30 tonight. That leaves very little time for the arrangement of the body. Your mother, is it not? Yes. You are taking her to Scotland? Yes, Edinburgh. Her home. Oh. Thank you. Rather a nuisance. Traveling by train. Ain't it? I'll get you. Go on, get on about your business.
I'm terribly sorry. Mr. Holmes? Hello. I was afraid you wouldn't get here in time. I was studying the faces of our fellow passengers. Fascinating hobby, and sometimes most enlightening. Lady Margaret is aboard the train, I presume? Oh, yes, Mother's expecting you. I've reserved a compartment for you and your friend, Dr. Watson. As a matter of fact, it's in this coach here, just ahead of the luggage van. Day coach? Yes, the sleepers are all taken. Mother wasn't interested in her bed so much as she wasn't getting to Edinburgh. So naturally, it wasn't very difficult to persuade her to travel in a day coach. Exactly. It had been open to take on additional passengers. So I observed. I say, it was awfully decent of you to come, considering the fact that I was so secretive about it all. Oh, my dear Mr. Carstairs, there was no need for secrecy. I already knew. You knew that Mother insisted on bringing the star of Rhodesia with her to London? And that while here, an attempt had been made to steal it. Did Scotland Yard tell you that? <laughs> oh, no, my dear Mr. Carstairs. But the fact that your mother owns the famous diamond is common knowledge. She came down to London to attend the reception of Buckingham Palace and quite naturally wore the star of Rhodesia. You want me to accompany you back to your home in Edinburgh. Therefore, an attempt must have been made to steal the star of Rhodesia while you were here in London. It seems simple the way you explain it, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'll wait here for my friend, Dr. Watson. I can't think what's keeping him. Mother and I will be expecting you. Oh, uh, could I take this for you? Oh, I'd be much obliged. Thank you. We'll be in compartment E. Yes. Ticket, please. Here's your carriage, sir. Well, 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 look who's here. Inspector Lestrade. Why, Mr. Holmes. Taking your trip, Inspector? Fishing, eh? Bit of an holiday. Ah, oh, that's very nice. Uh, trout? Huh? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah. Rather large rods for trout, aren't they? Salmon, perhaps. Well, as a matter of fact, I'm going mostly for the rest. As a matter of fact, you're on a job for Scotland Yard, aren't you? I uh, trust this is the uh, right carriage. This is where we take care of the overflow, sir. Oh, I see. Porter will take your bags. I'll carry this myself, if you don't mind. Ready to go, sir. Half past seven, eh? We always leave on time. Watson! Coming home! Watson! All right, home, they're coming! I beg your pardon. I beg your Thank you for your timely assistance. Really, Watson, aren't you a little stop at this sort of thing? Rubbish. I deal weight for a man of my age. Ran into an old friend of mine, Duncan Bleak. They took the cloth Indian lance. I saw Major Duncan Bleak, Mr. Sherlock Holmes. How do you do, sir? I'm delighted. I've heard quite a lot about you. India, eh? Retired 15 years ago. As a matter of fact, we were reminiscing about India. Didn't realize how late it was. It stays light so long these days, we almost missed the train. Yes, yeah, so I've heard. In here, sir. Right. Thank you. Uh, doctor, would you care to join me in a glass of whiskey and a dash of soda before dinner? No, ma'am. It's a good idea. What's it all about, Holmes? Huh? Did you ever hear of Lady Margaret Carstairs, famous down in the Star of Rhodesia? There was something in last week's tackle about the old girl being in London with a ball ball. Wasn't there, Holmes? Yes, there was. She's on this train. That's why we're here, to see that this bauble, as you call it, gets safely back into its fault at Edinburgh. Hmm, sounds to me like... Pardon me. Sounds to me like a police routine job. That's where you're wrong, old fellow. An attempt to make away with in London was unsuccessful. The second attempt will, in all probability, be made on this train. Well, huh? What makes you say that? Well, it seems more than likely that the people who planned the first attempt will not be discouraged by one failure and will stop at nothing to ensure success the second time. Sounds like Lestrade's cup of tea to me. Lestrade? He's on this train. Oh, is he? <laughs> giving an excellent imitation of Isaac Walton. And here we are. Pardon, gents. Well, come in, Mr. Holmes. My friend and colleague, Dr. Watson. How do you do? I thought it better to engage Mr. Holmes after what happened in London. No doubt you're an efficient person, but I don't think there's any need for a policeman. Policeman? 
How long have you been in possession of the Star of Rhodesia, Lady Margaret? 25 years. You know, it may seem strange to you, but uh, I've never actually seen it. I suppose there's no harm since we're paying you to guard it. Mother. Yes? May I? Do, by all means. Thank you. Great Scott. What a remarkable stone. My husband gave it to me on our fifth wedding anniversary. 423 carats, isn't it? The original diamond was over 700 carats. Yes. Your father had it cut. Less ostentatious. Ostentatious? As big as a duck's egg. Watson, please. Oh, sir. Thank you, Lady Margaret. We'll be as unobtrusive as possible. That will be a novelty from a policeman. Now, if you wouldn't mind telling us where our compartment is. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Holmes. Oh, thank you. Lady Margaret? Good night. Good night. Good night. Impertinence. She called us policemen. And what's wrong with being a policeman? Oh, hello, Lestrade. Where are you going? The inspector's going to Scotland to fish for salmon. Oh, really? The season doesn't start for another month, but you wouldn't know that, would you? Who says I'm going to fish for salmon? Who? Him. Uh, oh. Excuse me, please. Police. Police? Here? On the train? Scotland Yard, I heard. I warned you. Oh, Mr. Holmes? Yes, oh, this way, please. Well, there you are, Holmes. Try some of this curry. It's excellent. Steak and kidney pudding, please. Of course, the Bengal curry doesn't compare with that of Madras. No, it's the quality of the mutton that makes a difference, don't you think? The, uh, the meat's unimportant. It's the spices that make the difference. Don't you agree with me, Holmes? What? I said we were, we were discussing curry. Oh, yes, curry. Horrible stuff. Oh, really? One man's meat is another man's poison. <laughs> there will be two of us, steward. My son will be here directly. My dear fellow, I still insist the unpolished wild rice does make a considerable difference to a good curry. Well, I still can't agree with you. Take care of this for me, will you, Watson? A job for it. That was one of them. Was young Carstairs in the dining car with you? No, Lady Margaret came in alone. Well, I was in my compartment just now, having a bite to eat, and... I had a crash in here. Crash? It's locked. I knocked and there was no answer. So you just stood here twiddling your thumbs. Brilliant. Attendant, yes, will you please unlock this door? I'm sorry, sir. It's this is the... Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. That's all right. You can open it. Very good, sir.
dead. Murdered. That's a big quick, isn't it, even for you? Is this the, uh... Yes. Star Rhodesia was in this box not 45 minutes ago. How do you know? I saw it. Well, it might be here somewhere. No, I'm not good looking for it, Lestrade. Killer's got it. Ah, oh, there you are, Holmes. How about joining us Take in the... Take this body, will you, Watson? Body? Good Scott. How do you know it's murder, Mr. Holmes? Murder? Oh, I say. Who are you? Major Duncan Preek, a friend of Dr. Watson's. Oh. Well, what, what makes you so sure it's murder, Mr. Holmes? The door was locked. Every attendant has a key. Did you open this door for anyone during the last hour? No, sir. Was the key ever out of your possession? It never is, sir. It's on a chain. It's to me like heart failure. Uh -huh. Any marks of violence on the body? None that I can see. You seemed to have missed it this time, didn't you, Mr. Holmes? Possibly. Still, if it was a natural death, it came at a very convenient time, didn't it? Hmm? What does this mean? Rudisha, it's gone. You were supposed to guard it. My son employed you. That's why I left it with him. Where is he? I'm sorry, Lady Margaret. It was thoughtless of us to let you come in like this. You're an empty compartment? Yes, sir. Then I think we'd better... If you don't mind, Lady Margaret, please. Poor chap's mother, I presume. Yeah. Well, let's get to the bottom of this. Uh, excuse me, Doctor. Poor chap, he was so young. It's such a pity. I have sent for the conductor, Lestrade. You want to talk to him, and I've asked that no one be allowed to leave this coach. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Holmes. Shall we use my compartment? Thanks. Attendant. Yes, sir. Lock that door and let no one go in without my permission. You understand? Very good, sir. Right. Sorry, old man. Official police business. That's all right. I'll catch up with you later. Are you looking for the Scotland Yard inspector, sir? Uh, why, yes. Right in there, sir. Thank you. Come in. Sorry, sir. No one's allowed to leave the carriage. Can't leave the carriage? Whose ridiculous idea was that? Scotland Yard. Scotland. You see, we don't stop until we reach Rugby. That's right, sir. Good. We'll have a thorough search of the train made before that time. Find the murderer, Inspector, and you'll find the diamond. But we don't know it was murder. Consider the facts, Lestrade. Young Carstairs was dead when the jewel was taken. Otherwise, he'd have put up a struggle, and there were no marks of violence on the body. If, however, he died a natural death, we must assume that the thief happened to be on hand just at the right moment, which is outside the realm of probability. No, Lestrade, in this case, nothing was left to chance. That's why I say find the murderer and you'll find the diamond. How do we know the thief didn't leave the carriage before we discovered the body? The attendant was in the corridor the entire time, and he's certain that no one passed into the dining car. The door at the other end leads into the luggage van. Which is always locked. Oh. You found no marks of any kind on the body, Watson? No, none of any significance. Not even a scratch? Well, there was a small spot of blood on his neck, just a mere speck. That's what I was referring to. You mean that scratch killed him? It's possible the poison that went into the wound did. Poison? Well, we can't tell that without an autopsy. Mm. Have you got a list of the passengers in this carriage? Uh, yes, sir. There you are, sir. Thank you. Major Duncan Bleak. That would be your friend, Doctor. The next compartment's empty. Where well, we took Lady Margaret after the murder. You remember, Lestrade. Go on. Vivian Vedder and Inspector Lest That's this one. Lady Margaret Carstairs and the Honourable Roland Carstairs. Professor William Kilbane, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Shellcross, Mr. Holmes, and Dr. Watson. Well, that would be you two. Well, 
I think I shall ask a few questions. Vivian Vedder. We'll start with her, whoever she is. Vedder, compartment C. Oh, here we are. Empty. Sir Holmes, are you going to let Lestrade handle this thing by himself? Well, after all, he does represent the official police, you know. <laughs> well, with him doing the questioning and looking under the seat cushions for diamonds, I won't know any more than we're through and we do now. I could do it better myself. Why don't you, old fellow? Huh? By Jove, I think I will. Probably find out just as much of the stars would anyway. I'll do it at once. Oh, yes. That's where we just came from. What? Yes, sir? Oh, that's where the body is. Well, I'll start with this one. <coughs> yes? My name's Watson. Dr. Watson. Oh, to what am I indebted for this intrusion? I'm afraid I've got to ask you one or two questions what you're doing on the train, where you're going, things like that, you know. Why? Customary. Uh, there's been a, a murder committed. Scotland Yard, uh, murder Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes and I... What about Sherlock Holmes? We're cross-examining suspects. Suspects? Of what am I suspected? Oh, the fellow's dead. Murdered, you know. Now, let me get this straight. You say a murder has been committed on this train? Oh, uh, next compartment. And because a perfect stranger to me got himself murdered, you come to question me? Well, we've got to question everybody. Are you a policeman? No. Then by what right do you force your way into my compartment? Well, I... Uh... What are you doing on this train? Where are you going? Not going anywhere. Holmes and I are on the train to watch the... I know. It's a diamond or a pearl oh, or something no. of fabulous value. This fellow Holmes is always chasing after missing jewels or mysterious females. What is the meaning of this? I'm sorry, Miss Vera. But it was necessary for us to search your compartment. Indeed. May I ask what you expected to find? A valuable jewel has been stolen. And a man has been murdered. We are making a routine search of the entire carriage and asking a few questions. Go right ahead. I understand your journey is rather a sad one. Your mother... Yes. Perhaps we'd better not question Miss Vedder just now, Lestrade. Eh? Excuse us, will you? What's the idea, Mr. Holmes? Not of taste, Lestrade. The young lady is taking her mother to Scotland for burial. In a coffin? That is the customary method, I believe. Lestrade, I think we'll take a look at that coffin. Might prove interesting. Hmm. I was about to suggest that very thing myself, Mr. Holmes. Conductor, I'll have a look in the luggage van. Uh, this way, sir. That I am, Dr. Watson. Dr. John H. Watson of 221B Baker Street. Retired. My friend Sherlock Holmes can vouch for him. Your alibi isn't worth a scotch party. Just told me that this fellow Holmes is a crony of yours. Naturally, he'd lie. I resent that, sir. Sherlock Holmes is a very soul of integrity. He might even be an accomplice. Why, if I were a policeman, I'd take you in charge this very moment. I didn't do it, sir. I swear I didn't do it. I can prove it. Prove what, old Oh, there you are, Holmes. Now get out of here and join your silly friend. Did you discover anything, Watson? Yes. He's a very suspicious character. He tried to put me off the scent. From the little I heard, he seemed reasonably successful. Mm. Look here, you're not going to let an old fellow like Professor Kilbane discourage you, are you? Uh, why don't you try this one? You think I'd better? Yes, of course. Mm. All right. Uh, do, do, do you mind if I come in? You may. Thank you. I'm sorry to bother you, but I represent the police. I knew it. Alfred, I told you. Told him what? Well, it's 
quite all right, Inspector. I'll confess. Confess? You mean you stole it? You, you've got it in there? Yes. No, no, no. Leave it where it is. I'll go and fetch Inspector Lestrade of Scotland Yard. And don't either of you attempt to run away. Oh, no, Inspector. Is this door always kept locked, Conductor? Yes, sir. Only the guard and myself have keys. Mm. Got them, Holmes. Who? Oh. The thieves. Thieves? Well, come on, speak up. They're married a couple down there. Mr. Mrs. Sharkroft. Yes, they confessed. Confessed? Broke them down. Gave them the third degree. Uh, and you left them unguarded? I told them not to run away. Well, better have a talk with them. Oh, it's uh, you again. It might interest you to know that I've just caught the thieves. Excuse me, madam. You're the police, I know. Mm. I warned them, but no, he had to take it. Well, I must warn you that anything you say may be used against you. Anything they say. They've already admitted everything. Everything? Yes, they've got it in there. I'd be glad to pay double what it's worth if only they won't prosecute. It's my first offence. You chaps always say the same thing. Come on, hand it over. Where is it? I stole it. I took it from a hotel in London. Come on, come on. In my small way, I'm a collector of teapots. Teapots? Dr. Watson, does this look like a diamond? Not very much, now that you mention it. Well, what's all that about a confession? Well, when I came in here before, they, they said that they took it. Well, you are please oblige us, Doctor, by not meddling in police business. This time wasn't entirely wasted, Lestrade. At least you've recovered the teapot. Thank you, Holmes. Teapot. The fellow tries his best. What's he get? Humiliation and abuse from the start of all people. A good man to chuck up the whole case. Might be a good idea to let the police do their own work. You mind your own business. Oh, there you are, Watson. How about a spot in my compartment? Thanks, old man. Serve them right if I, if I got a bit tiddler. <laughs> I suppose you realize you'll be turned over to the police as soon as we reach Edinburgh. Dr. Watson, teapots. Why beg your pardon, Professor Kilbane? You're in the next compartment, aren't you? I am. I'm afraid we'll have to ask you a few questions. Now, don't tell me that you're going to start. You mind? Well, of course I mind. Come on, in you go. A brilliant mind, but there have been times when... Uh, when your scientist's mind has shown him the way. Exactly. You take the death of young Carstairs, for instance. I knew from the first it was poison. The scientific approach, of course. The murderer used a hypodermic. Some rare poison from, from South America, probably. Or India. Yes, yes, India. I've been to India. So have you. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> well. You've been... <laughs> You've been in here. I don't like your attitude, Professor Kilbane. I don't like it at all. Perhaps not. But I'm on this train for legitimate reasons. And I've neither the time nor the inclination to assist you with your work. You're perfectly within your rights, sir, and I'm sure that Inspector Lestrade appreciates that. Thank you, sir. Now, if you have no objection, I have some work to do which requires concentration. Mathematics? Yes. Interesting study. Well, if you don't mind. Looking for something, Lady Margaret? Oh. I came to get my bed. The door's locked. Naturally. Perhaps I can help you. Thank you. Mr. Holmes. I must talk to you about the diamond. Oh, don't you worry about that, Lady Margaret. 
fifty thousand pounds and you tell me not to worry? My son employed this man to guard it, and it was stolen right under his very nose. I warn you, I intend to take this matter up with your superiors. I'm a private agent, Lady Margaret. Good. I shall report you both to Scotland Yard. But I am Scotland Yard. Lady Carstairs entered the dining car alone. You and I were already there. Holmes came in later, and I understand that Inspector Lestrade remained in his compartment with the curtains open, so that if anyone had gone in or out, he would have seen them. I see, you've got something there. Well, let's look at this thing objectively. Lady Carstairs seemed more concerned, was more concerned at the loss of the diamond than at the death of her son. Right, George, you're right. So she was. Come in. Oh, here you are, Watson. Oh, sit down. Have a drink? Uh, no, thanks. Do you mind if I, uh... <laughs> Not at all. I've been thinking about this case, Holmes, that is, Duncan Bleak and I have. Yes, so I see. Well, the way we figure it out, the old trout is the only one without an alibi. Yes, we feel that you're approaching the whole thing from the wrong angle. Really, Watson? What's your theory? Insurance. A lot of people insure jewellery and then try and collect on it. Interesting suggestion. Mm -hmm. I suppose you go and ask Lady Margaret just how much insurance she carries on the Star of Odisha. No, thank you. We've already had two tries. Why don't you ask yourself? For a very simple reason, I already know. You're quite a doofer, sir. Oh, if you know, would you ask me? <laughs> Trying to make a fool of me. In the first movie, Sherlock Holmes squared off against his arch enemy, Professor Moriarty. Now here, in Terror by Night, Holmes brings up the name of another master criminal, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Now Moran had quite a resume in the stories written by Arthur Conan Doyle, to the extent that Holmes knew practically every detail about him from birth. A master jewel thief, Colonel Moran was also a reliable and deadly henchman in the service of Professor Moriarty. Now, he's featured in, in Game of Shadows, the 2011 sequel to the first Sherlock Holmes film that starred Robert Downey Jr. and Jude Law. And my powers of deduction tell me that we will be meeting the good Colonel before the train reaches its final destination. Okay. Let's get back to Terror by Night. Mr. and Mrs. Shawcross, teapots. Well, we can eliminate them. Professor William Kilbane. I've sent a telegram to the Edinburgh police to check up on that mathematics professor. Interesting. Now what? Well, just a coincidence. What's a coincidence? The fact that this fellow Kilbane happens to be a professor of mathematics. Oh. Come again, Mr. Holmes? The star, did you ever hear of Colonel Sebastian Moran? Of course I did. What about him? Well, then, as you know, Colonel Sebastian Moran was the most sinister, ruthless, and diabolically clever henchman of our late but unlamented friend, Professor Moriarty. I've never seen him, but I've been unpleasantly conscious of his presence more than once. As a matter of fact, he was directly responsible for what very nearly turned out to be my premature death on three separate occasions. Very pretty, Mr. Holmes. What's all that got to do with all this? Well, possibly nothing. However, his speciality was spectacular jewel robberies. And for relaxation, he was addicted to the study of uh, mathematics. Are you inferring that this Professor Kilbane is Colonel Sebastian Moran, that he murdered young Carcés and stole the diamond? Well, what about this woman, this uh, Vivian Vedder? What about her? No one's above suspicion. And Lady Margaret. She might have a motive for wanting the star of Radisha stolen. She wasn't very concerned over the death of her son. And this friend of Dr. Watson's, this uh, Major Duncan Bleak, might be just as sensible to suspect him. Now, as far as we know, only four persons knew the star of Radisha was on this train. Yourself, Dr. Watson, the murdered, the dead lad, and myself. And Lady Margaret. And Lady Margaret. I'll have another talk with her ladyship. Mr. 
Lady Margaret, do you mind if I uh, come in? Lucky beggar. Who's a lucky beggar? Duncan Bleak. Been playing cards with him. He won all the way across, I believe the expression is. Have you been with him all this time? Yeah, just left him. He introduced me to a, a new fangle game. Gin rummy, he called it. American, I believe. A lot of bookkeeping connected with it. Do you, uh, ever hear of it? Looking for the murderer, Inspector? <laughs> Impossible fellow. Well, there you are. Where on earth have you been? I asked you where you'd been. Hello? What's happened? I've been observing the landscape from the door at the end of the corridor. I've just been along there. I didn't see you. The, the door was shut. Actually, I was on the outside. The outside? Yes. You must try it sometime. We'll go take a look at that coffin. If you remember, I was interrupted the last time. Oh, sorry. Sherlock Holmes, do you mind if I inspect a copy in your feet into Scotland? No one is allowed in here, Mr. Holmes. I'll take the responsibility. Excuse me. Does it occur to you, Watson, that this is a very unusual coffin? I don't know. A trifle ornate, perhaps. I wasn't thinking of the fittings. It's a... Do you mind if we open it? It's forbidden, sir. Sorry. Go on, Watson. 
But you can't do that, sir. We'll have to. Excuse me, please. Little old lady. As I thought, shallow. The body only comes down to about here. You think there's a secret compartment underneath? There has to be. Empty. Yes, but it's been recently occupied. We asked Lestrade to come in here. He's with Lady Margaret. Right, Your Holmes. Have you let anyone else in here? No. Madam Alex, eh? Gives me something to do. Come quick. What is it? It's the coffin. Holmes found a false bottom in it. Enough room for the murderer to hide in. What? What is all this, Mr. Holmes? There's where your murderer's been hiding, Mr. Ard. <laughs> it's just a question of finding him, isn't it, Mr. Holmes? Not him, them. Eh? This affair is obviously the work of two men, the one who planned it and the other who hid in the coffin and at a prearranged time emerged to commit the murder and effect the robbery. What are you talking about? Colonel Sebastian Moran. You've got that man on the brain, Mr. Holmes. My dear Lestrade, I accepted this case because I was virtually certain that Colonel Sebastian Moran could not resist such a tempting morsel as the star of Rhodesia. I'm convinced that he's the brains behind this case and that he's on this train. Oh, and... How would you go about finding out which one of the passengers is this Colonel Sebastian Moran? If he is one of the passengers. Well, I suggest that you start by questioning Miss Vera. It might prove interesting. Huh? Oh. you a few questions, and I must warn you, anything you say may be used against you. Oh? Now, about your mother. It isn't your mother after all, is it? Perhaps if you explain. That coffin, we've examined it. And found the secret compartment. Oh, come on, let's have it. Have what? The old story. If you insist. A man approached me and asked me to take a coffin to Scotland. He offered me a hundred pounds. Were you aware that the coffin had a secret compartment? I was. What story did this person tell you to account for a man being concealed in the coffin? That someone had to leave London. Foreign agents were watching the train. Foreign agents? All right. Maybe I didn't believe that foreign agent story. You realize, of course, this makes you an accomplice. What was the name of the man who approached you? I don't remember. Uh, Miss Vera, the man who engaged you to take this coffin to Scotland, was it by any chance this man here? I say, old man, aren't you making a mistake? My dear Watson, just what do you know about Major Duncan Bleak? I've known him for years. He's a member of my club. I say, is this a joke? Does the name Colonel Moran mean anything to you, sir? Colonel Moran? Yes, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Well, I'm afraid it doesn't. Good heavens, you don't think that oh, I... Oh, no, 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 of course not. You have the perfect alibi, Dr. Watson. Yes, 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 of course, of course. But good heavens, gentlemen, you're at perfect liberty to search my compartment, to search me. If you find the diamond, I... Now, that won't be necessary. The star of Rhodesia has not been stolen. What's that, Mr. Holmes? An imitation was stolen. I have the real one. You've got it? My dear Lestrade, surely you didn't think I would allow Lady Margaret to retain the genuine diamond when I felt reasonably certain that an attempt would be made to steal it? I have had it in my possession almost from the moment I boarded the train. Confound it, Mr. Holmes, you had no right to do that. This is a police matter. Come on, let me have it. My job is to see that it wasn't stolen. It wasn't. Look, I don't know what this is all about, but I do know that i never seen this gentleman before in my life. I shall have to ask you to remain in your compartment until we reach Edinburgh. Uh, Inspector Lestrade. Huh? Oh, a uh, telegram for you, sir. Thank you. I'm sorry, old man. I... I'm afraid my friend owes you an apology. Oh, that's all right, Watson. In a case like this, naturally everyone is suspected. Well, we all make mistakes. Even Holmes is not infallible. 
And after all, the killer is still at large, you know. Yes, he is, isn't he? Well, good night. Good night, old boy. Don't worry. I think I'll have another little chat with that professor fellow. Something important, Lestrade? You have your secrets, Mr. Holmes, I have mine. This is Inspector Lestrade. Look here. Is this racket going to continue all night? Professor Kilbane, you told me you were on the staff of the University of Edinburgh. I said nothing of the kind. You most certainly did. I urge you. Mr. Holmes, here, urge you. Oh. I merely said that I was a professor of mathematics and that I was returning to my home in Edinburgh. Well, it might be necessary to talk to you again. Later. You come pounding on this door again and I'll have the law on you. I am the law. Then stop barging in and out of my room like a chambermaid. Where is everybody? Sorry, chap. Doesn't want to open the door, probably. This should help us. Academic. Look again, old fellow. Scratch. Just a scratch. Like the one on Ronald Carstairs. Small dart. Apparently made of some soluble substance. It's probably a gelatin preparation that melts in the wound. That's why you couldn't see anything on Carstairs. The murderer was about to get rid of the body. When you heard the knock and became frightened. Here, let me have that, will you? from that door. Were you seen coming in here? No. Sherlock Holmes and the fat bloke are in the luggage van now. How about the guard in the corridor? He didn't see me. I fixed him temporarily. The guard in the van did. I had to kill him. Here, yeah, you'd better take this. This isn't the star of Rhodesia. You wouldn't be trying to double-cross me, would you? Sherlock Holmes got the diamond and replaced it with this imitation. Now that Scotland Yard inspector has the real star of Rhodesia. Was he with Holmes and Watson in the luggage van? No. Good, then he's probably in his compartment. But you'll have to hurry. I don't like it. Neither do I. All you have to do is to relieve him of the diamond. Scotland Yard inspector, why, that, that's something different. Naturally, it will mean more money for you. You'd like that, wouldn't you? Come on. Here. 
He's in there. He's got the diamond. Hello. That fellow you put on guard isn't there. That's my observe. Strange. What is? Stroud. Yeah. Help me to get him up onto this seat. <clears throat> He's coming too. Mm. Hand me that water, will you? Well, it's nothing very serious. I'll attend to it properly later on. Hmm. Poison like the others. Yeah, it's gone. The diamond's gone. Gone? Yeah. And we better search the murder at once? It's no use, old fellow. The man who killed him has the star, Bradisha. What's that? It's an air pistol, Estrade, that fires a poison dart. It's quite an unusual design. You were attacked because you had the diamond. Fortunately, this wasn't used on you. Hello, we're coming to a stop. Scottish police. Oh. I don't feel up to it, Mr. Holmes. Would you be good enough to talk to them? Certainly. Thank you. You keep quiet, old boy. Be back in a minute. Right. Mr. Holmes, this is Inspector MacDonald of the Edinburgh Police. How do you do? I happen to be in this district on another case, and I received this telegram from headquarters. You want to talk to Inspector Lestrade? In due time, but I'm in charge here. This is Scotland. You've crossed the border. We've had a spot of trouble here, Inspector. And that's why I'm here. And who are you, might I ask? Who's <laughs> Sherlock Holmes? And a private inquiry agent, eh? I've heard of you. Heard of him? Mr. Holmes has practically solved this case already. Watson, will you clear the dining car? I'll want to ask a few questions. Yes, sir. And see that no one leaves his compartment until I need him for questioning. Very good, sir. 
Inspector Lestrade asked me to sit in with you. Mm, it's a bit unusual, but... Uh... Scotland Yard think a great deal of Mr. Sherlock Holmes. They frequently ask his advice. Scotland Yard, eh? Where is this Inspector Lestrade? Now, Watson, will you see if Inspector Lestrade is sufficiently recovered to come into the dining car? Right, you are. I know all about you, and frankly, you're in for it. All I did was buy a coffin and bring it on the train. In my opinion, this is a matter for Scotland Yard. Scotland Yard's jurisdiction ended when you crossed the border, Inspector. So you say? That's a matter of opinion. Miss Vader is unquestionably in the plot. But you may not know Colonel Moran, however. I don't. Colonel Sebastian Moran? Is he in this? You know him? Unfortunately, I do. Uh, you may return to your compartment. You said unfortunately. Aye. I once had an encounter with Colonel Moran. The only time in my entire career I've been bested. My cleverest criminal since the late Professor Moriarty. And then I concur. Well, where is this Sebastian Moran? He's traveling on this train under the name of Major Duncan Bleak. What on earth are you talking about? Are you serious, Mr. Holmes? Constable, bring in Duncan Bleak. Aye, sir. Duncan Bleak? But he played for the gentleman at Lord's. Come in. Duncan Bleak? Yes? Inspector McDonald would like to see you. All right. Colonel Sebastian Moran, eh? It will give me great pleasure, Mr. Holmes, to meet up with that scoundrel again. You wanted to see me? Yes, Colonel Moran. You're under arrest. Oh, so you've managed to convince him that I'm the mythical Colonel Moran. Not mythical, Colonel. Have you forgotten that affair at Inverness three years ago? I've never been in Inverness in my life. Do you mind if I search you? Go ahead. For an innocent man, you carry strange things in your pockets. A retired army officer, India. But you're in Scotland now, and there's a law against carrying firearms. Well, are you satisfied? Not quite, Colonel. Mm. Now I am satisfied. This clears things up pretty well. <laughs> We'll be coming into Topham in a few minutes. The train doesn't stop at Topham, I'm afraid. I'm afraid you're wrong this time, Holmes. This train will stop at Topham. You're only delaying the inevitable, Colonel Moran. You can't get away. Donald, here's your man. Who pulled that cord? It's all right, Conductor. We'll get off here with our prisoner. Constables, take him off. Quite a struggle, Inspector McDonald. Good work, Mr. Holmes. Perhaps I underestimated you. Was it you who hit me? Oh, I'm terribly sorry. You must accept my apologies. Scott, it's Duncan Bleak. I mean, Colonel Sebastian Moran. Come on, old fellow, give me a hand. What's all this about? Where's Inspector McDonald? He's just gone off the train. He couldn't have. He couldn't. Oh, but he has. A very clever plot, Colonel Moran. 
Your henchmen, masquerading as policemen, come aboard the train, arrest you, stop the train, and take you off. But this is fantastic. Yes, it is, isn't it? And it's a scheme worthy of Colonel Sebastian Moran. He planned the whole thing, including the coffin with the secret compartment. And in case anything went wrong, the pseudo-policeman to come aboard and take him off the train before it reached Edinburgh. Then, uh, where is Lestrade? Well, I imagine at the moment he's pretty well occupied. Just a minute, MacDonald. Get over there, all of you. You're under arrest. Now, put up your hands. Driver, take us to the nearest police station. Come on, get over here. Then the poke in the eye I received from Sherlock Holmes wasn't an accident after all. That is a matter of opinion. Come on, get in. Send that over as soon as possible, will you? Very good, sir. It's a telegram to the real Edinburgh police. Ask him to meet us when we arrive. But how did you know this fellow wasn't the real Inspector MacDonald? Elementary, my dear Watson. In the first place, he didn't put handcuffs on Colonel Moran, so I had to do it myself. And in the second place, Inspector MacDonald during the fight was more hindrance than help, which is not characteristic of a real policeman. Amazing, Holmes. I'm covering such a fiendish spot with so little evidence. Yes, I forgot to mention that uh, I also happen to know the real Inspector MacDonald of the Edinburgh Police. Oh, was, it, was Lestrade in on all this? Yes, and surprisingly enough, he grasped the situation immediately. It's very unusual. Let's hope he hasn't overdone it. <laughs> very clever, Holmes. You've got me, but you haven't got the star of Rhodesia. Oh, but I have. If in the dark I could substitute a big hulk like Lestrade for you, Colonel Moran, it's no very great feat to... Uh, switch a little thing like a diamond. As I mentioned at the outset, Terror by Night was the next to last Sherlock Holmes feature that starred Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce. The 14th and final entry, Dressed to Kill, produced in late 1946, marked the end of a very successful run spanning nearly eight years. A Sherlock Holmes would not appear again on the big screen for another 16 years when a rather weak German-produced film called Sherlock Holmes and the Deadly Necklace was made. Although there were numerous TV and radio appearances by the great detective, it almost seemed like Rathbone and Bruce had the final word on the movie screens, at least until the 1970s. Uh, not surprisingly, Basil Rathbone's movie career took a downward turn after the final Sherlock Holmes film. Like many Hollywood actors, he was so closely tied to the character that he never really got the opportunity to break free of the association. In his later years, he often played roles that spoofed his earlier characters, and he occasionally appeared in camp, often cheap horror movies, alongside old veterans like Lon Chaney Jr. and John Carradine. He died of a heart attack in 1967, age 75. For this movie fan, Basil Rathbone was the Sherlock Holmes. For Public Domain Classics and McMinnville Community Media, I'm Walt Height. <laughs>